This is our legal disclaimer. Our crowd's not providing any investment advice. Please read it thoroughly. If anyone would like a copy of it after, please let me know. When people decide that they want to make private investments in companies, our crowd represents a great opportunity to access curated deal flow. Again, when you've decided that investing in private companies is something that you want, we think that we are a fantastic option. So as you can see, a very small portion of someone's investable assets, while we're not giving investment advice, is, I guess, on the extreme side, put in the uh, private investment side. So again, if you're looking to invest in private companies, uh, our card provides a very good access to deal flow. Not only are we a platform for investing in specific companies, but we're also an ecosystem and a marketplace where we bring together portfolio companies, investors, multinational service providers, and everyone else so that we can provide tremendous value at scale. People who can participate in the capacity as investors have to be what's called accredited. And that is something that's defined by your local, by your residency, where you spend six months or more per year. So if you want to understand what your laws or which laws dictate which will enable you to make an investment, either you can ask me privately or go on Wikipedia or some other type of resource. Our crowd makes its offerings under Reg D. We are SEC compliant. So all of these investment opportunities require that only accredited investors uh, who validate their accreditedness participate. Now, investors can choose to make investments as individuals, entities, trusts, what have you. They can utilize IRAs. Whatever way in which someone wants to make an investment, we can facilitate that. When someone joins the R Crowd platform, they're prompted to provide basic information like their name and email so that they can have accounts created for them on the website. They identify what their country of residency is, and then they say how they are accredited. Now, depending on what country you put in in the residency status, you will be prompted with the local laws for accreditation, which you have to identify, self-declare, what qualifies you. That is not a capability that our platform has. And for someone who's simply curious about what are the different laws, I can individually share that with you. I can kind of go through all the different pages. But we haven't identified that as a relevant customer user experience where they would have to choose. Because it's really, you only have one residency. And depending on where you've decided your residency, you can see the specifics of the laws that go to that. So again, if you have any questions afterwards, I'm Noah, Noah at our crowd. I'd love to speak with every single one of you individually. Our crowd's value proposition is significantly predicated on the curation of deal flow, that we see several hundred opportunities a month funnel that down into a few selected investment opportunities. We negotiate the deal terms on behalf of the crowd and for ourselves. We put our own capital into every single investment. We then open it up to the crowd to participate. And then post-investment, we engage our community to utilize their network to benefit the crowd and their own investments. People can choose to invest with our crowd by three basic choices. You can either find individual companies, we call that Startup Select, where you're choosing every individual company that you can identify, do the diligence on, and choose this one. You can go by funds. We've, in 2015, launched our first fund, and last year I believe we had about six or seven new funds, where you can even start diversifying your investments in startups 
into funds. With a minimum of $50,000 per fund, you can actually build a nice portfolio of funds. And for individuals who want to use some uh, you know, discretion and um, discipline in their investments, where they want to set aside a certain amount of money to make investments in startups in a particular time frame of their choice, and want to simplify the process in which they make investments, we have a tool called the Portfolio Reserve, which you effectively pre-fund an account and then utilize at your discretion into investments. On the platform, once you've signed on, there are portfolio companies which you can identify as being either interesting to you or not. As you click on the companies that you find interesting, as a standard practice, we provide information about the management team, oftentimes quote, said to be the most important part of a startup because ideas can change, but people is much more difficult to change. You have our seven to 12 page diligence report where we talk about the competitive landscape, the business model, the general and specific risks that could apply. That's called the hour take. We have the deal terms, which investors can look and see what everybody in the round is investing at and according to. You can watch a recorded webinar, which is also offered to the crowd live. But for people with busy schedules or whatever reason they can't make something live, it's recorded for them. And we also offer the company's presentation, which you can review and utilize as a basis for your diligence on particular companies. Post-investment, we share with information about general portfolios and individual companies. We let you know what's pending, what's closed. You can see your executed articles of partnership, which is your proof of ownership post-investment, distribution statements when the companies have exits, quarterly reports, which are updated notifications about how your portfolio companies are doing, provided on a quarterly basis. We also recently introduced a quarterly holdings report, which can basically give you a bird's eye view of how your portfolio is doing. We do not mark to market. So unless there's a follow on round from an external funding source, which is agreed upon the new valuation, we will keep the valuation at par. For example, our crowd made an investment in a company called Argus. We made a single investment. It was held at par until the company was bought by Continental for a very significant increase in valuation. But for those two years, it was flat. So to the extent that this is helpful, grain of salt. In general, we're talking about how to be more of an engaged uh, community. We have events around the world. If you go on the website, there's a tab of events, which you can see the Global Investor Summit. And also, we have other global events that are hosted in our offices around the world, Singapore, uh, Australia, New York, uh, La Jolla, and other countries. John just announced that we have three more new offices, and we look to engage with you all around the world. And that's pretty much the beginning of the conversation. I'm going to take a few questions now, and then we're going to move over to Anu, who's going to talk about her experiences and how she got involved and how she's gotten even more involved. And then we're going to have Robbie Citrin talk about, in general, tax. Not specific tax, but elements that revolve around tax. So we're going to do a little bit of Q&A now, and then we'll do a larger session of Q&A afterwards. So I'll take the first question, the gentleman over there. Good question. So the question is, is how do I get my money out, basically? Yes? Our crowd makes long-term illiquid investments. That's something that we need to be communicating very clearly from the get-go. The secondary market, which would enable liquidity in the interim, is not yet created. We do not have that. We're working on identifying options, but at present, it does not exist. So therefore, liquidity will happen when there are exits. 
In general, it could happen anywhere between the next day and seven years, 12 years. Mobile, I think, was 14 years. And you can also have quick turnarounds. There's no way to know. And the exits happen. So I hope that answered your question. Um, uh, Oh, so our crowd had two types of exits so far, one in which we gave investors actual stock from the IPO on NASDAQ, and other situations when there's an M&A, a merger and acquisition, we actually gave cash. Question over here? Unless you don't have. So I'll go a little bit into accreditation, and then I'm going to introduce Anu so that we can get to slightly more uh, exciting part of the thing. But as a U.S. citizen and an Israeli resident, you have a citizen as well. correct? Citizenship doesn't. Uh, determine your accreditation status. It's where you spend six months or more. And the difference between U.S. law and Israeli law is the U.S. requires third-party verification, accountant, lawyer, broker, to say that you have earned either as an individual $250,000 annually or $300,000 with a spouse or have a million dollars of assets, or if you're using a trust, $5 million in assets of the trust. So as an Israeli, you would have to self-declare as having over 8 million shekels in ass assets, excluding the primary residence, or income of 1.2 million shekels, or a combination of the two. So depending on your residency, you would have to declare here that I am yes, accredited based on your own assessment of your situation. So the second part of the reason I brought it up at the Aliyah wheel is that those of us who have 10 years of grace are not filing in both countries. Um, so do we wait for that to expire or do we pay taxes? So everyone should consult their accountant, lawyer, or broker. However, um, the tax question you're asking, Robbie can go a little more into. The other question is about accreditation and whether you're legally allowed to make investments. And that has to do with something that Robbie will also talk about, but um, again, privately I'm more than happy to talk about this with you after, and also if we have more time afterwards, because I apologize, I was late, uh, we can jump back into this specific topic. So without any further ado, Anu. Hi, I'm Anu Bardwaj, uh, founder of Women Investing in Women Digital. It's a media company. And I got involved with Our Crowd about five years ago. Um, a woman named Audrey Jacobs, who's one of the founding partners. She's based in San Diego, California. And we were having a Women Investing in Women Summit in San Diego, and I was referred to Audrey through one of our organizers, and uh, she blew the audience away. She, I met her probably a year later at a pitch competition, and she was grilling me. I thought she was so mean, um, but actually turned out to be one of my greatest advocates, and she said, I was so hard on you because I want you to succeed, and has gotten behind me since, and has been a huge supporter of this movement that we've created that's now um, resulted in over a million followers on Facebook, uh, global reach. Um, we've done summits all over the world and had private equity roundtables for women who wanted to learn how to invest. So Audrey's been one of my biggest champions, and I've stayed very close to the Our Crowd family since. Um, a little bit about my background. I used to raise uh, private equity and venture capital funds. I was a placement agent. And I was raising funds from India, the Nordics, the Middle East, um, a lot of US funds, uh, both uh, PEVC and fund of funds. And from the commissions that I made, I invested into real estate. I was a dirt investor. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I quintupled my money. And then from there, I started investing into angel deals. And these were small deals. 
um, startup women, uh, women-led startups, companies that I felt passionate about that I that I liked. I knew the founders, and I would get into their rounds, and I knew where they were in their cycle. So I was lucky that I was able to get my deal flow from some of the women that I'd been vetting for, from our various conferences. Um, I've invested about a million dollars, over a million dollars in my own business, Women Investing Women Digital. So I'm a different type of investor. Um, recently, I've gotten into crypto investing and blockchain investing. Um, been seeing triple digit returns there. We've had a little portfolio going. Um, and so with our crowd, I came across our crowd 50, and I thought this was an interesting vehicle because the amount of time it takes you to do due diligence and to make sure you're really like going into a company that has the right team, the right track record, um, and also the right direction. I think our crowd actually could simplify some of that, that difficulty and finding um, quality companies because they have so many eyeballs looking at this. And it's not my crowd, it's our crowd uh, at the end of the day. And there's so many of you that are, you know, um, alerted to, to interesting companies. And sometimes I would tell Audrey, look, I, this is an awesome company, check it out. And she'd have her whole team diligence it before I even take a look at it. So, so one thing that you might want to consider is if you want to go into a portfolio, diversify, this is a great way to do it. And also, it's so global. Like they've got offices everywhere. They've got offices in Australia and Singapore, um, obviously here in North America. And I know the team fairly well now. I've been interacting with them over the past three, four years, and uh, I have nothing but great things to say about them. Yeah. Hey, hi, everybody. My name is Robbie Citron. Um, you could all cheer now. <laughs> um, I've been with uh, our crowd from, from the very beginning. I've been working in the venture capital industry for nearly 20 years. Uh, I'm a CPA here in Israel, a, 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 an, an English accountant. Uh, so I've watched the um, VC industry grow very significantly over the last uh, 18 to 20 years, and I've been privileged to be a, a part of it. Now, um, the... Um, issues that I was asked to, to, to speak about are the tax implications of, of investing. Now, I, I, I have to give a um, a, 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 prefer, uh, a pre a pre a pre comment before I go into anything to do with tax. When you're making an investment, you make an investment because you think the investment is good. You think you're going to get a return on it, or you think it's contributing something. It's something that you are going to benefit from. Well, after you've made an investment, you decide an investment is good or not good, then you look at the tax implications. Do not make a, de a decision to make an investment um, because of tax. Now, having said that, I'll come back to it a little bit later on because there are some cases where you will make an investment because of tax, but I I'm going to contradict myself a little bit later. But as a rule of thumb, tax is not the reason to make an investment or not to make an investment. The ma you make an investment because it's going to return something, either monetary or other uh, assets to you later on. Now, our crowd is a global organization. When I say global, we're investing in countries mainly in Israel, but elsewhere. We have investors from 112 countries over the world. Um, that makes it a bit of a mishmash from a tax perspective. Where is the tax being li uh, becoming liable? Well, who is paying the tax? How are you paying the tax? Who's reporting tax? This is a very complicated um, uh, subject, and um, I, I will explain to you again. Noah made a, 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 an expression, a, a comment right at the beginning that we don't give advice, we don't give investment advice, we don't give tax advice. Um, but what I can explain is the fra framework within which we work. Um, so far, about 70% of our investments have been made in Israel. All our investments have been made and managed by our team that is based in Israel. So what we call here, what we, we have here is what we call a permanent establishment in Israel. We are, an, for a tax perspective, an Israeli organization. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Israeli tax law says that a non-Israeli citizen who invests in a tech company here in Israel is going to be exempted from tax. 
Um, what it means for an Israeli is you pay tax uh, as you would on any other investment you make in, in Israel, capital gains on, a, uh, on, on a sale of securities, tax on dividends, tax on interest, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if an, a non-Israeli is, uh, is exempt, that sounds very exciting and very, uh, uh, and very encouraging. But we have to take a little bit further because any non-Israeli who, who's investing serially out of Israel with a representative out of Israel can be deemed to be having a permanent establishment here in Israel. So even they're a non-Israeli per person, they're a non-Israeli citizen, they don't have a tax file in Israel, they can be deemed to be running a business out of Israel. And that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So what we are doing in our crowd is we're trying to clear the decks as much as possible. Uh, as I said, we can't answer every single tax uh, implication for every person in any, any jurisdiction in the world, but we are trying to make it as clear as possible. So we, like many other VC funds in, uh, uh, in Israel, have a ruling from the tax authority, which basically says that we are everybody's representative. Uh, anybody investing from abroad is, is investing through us. We report all the uh, profits and losses to the Israeli tax authority, and anybody who is not an Israeli will be exempted from tax. There's a, a special section in the Israeli ta tax code uh, 16A, which actually gives the tax uh, authorities the power to uh, exempt certain people from, ref from filing taxes and from paying taxes. And that's what we've done for our, our crowd investors. Now, that does not mean that Israelis are, are, are free of tax. Israelis pay tax like anybody else. And, and to answer the question that was, uh, was uh, asked just before, um, I don't want to mix up between accreditation on the one hand, which is whether you're allowed to invest, and taxation, which is wh wh how you pay the taxes afterwards. But any person who, is, uh, who has come on Aliyah and is making investments after they come on Aliyah in an Israeli company, they're still subject to tax here in Israel. If you are we're still living in, in America and making investments through, through our crowd, you will uh, be exempt from taxes in Israel. Now, that does not mean that you're going to be exempt from taxes in America or wherever else you live. But what we are trying to do in our crowd is to give you a clean slate. We are giving you reports. We're giving you capital account statements. If you're an American, we're giving you K-1 statements and saying, now, you've made an investment in an Israeli company through our crowd. You've got some profits from it. You take it. You report it in your own local ju jurisdiction. Within Israel, you are, you are uh, not required to do any reporting or to pay any tax. <clears throat> now, um, I just want to uh, mention one other thing that needs to, people need to be aware of when they're investing in companies, in companies that are uh, hopefully going to be exited. Now, there are two ways for a company to exit. A company can exit, be, be exited by... Uh, somebody coming along and saying, I'm buying the stock in your company. I'm buying the entire, the entire company. So any person who's invested through our crowd and invested in one of our partnerships, which gives them rights to the stock in the portfolio company, they will have their shares being sold. Those shares generate capital gain. And as I said to you, if you're not an Israeli, you're not going to be taxed in Israel on, the, on that capital gain. We will send you your K-1 if you're American. We'll send you a capital account statement of anybody else. And you'll take it to your accountant and you'll report the, report the profits and pay the tax in your local jurisdiction. However, where is the problem? The problem is sometimes a, a company will come along and say, I don't want to buy the company. Uh, it, there's a company here that um, is in a particular field. They're claiming uh, that they have uh, no outstanding uh, lawsuits or uh, uh, claims against them. And if you buy the company, you're buying all that package with, with the company. What they want to do is buy the assets of the company. So, the, uh, so Intel will come along and say, we like this company, we don't want the company. So I mean, Intel is a bad example because when Intel buys companies, it generally buys the whole company. But I'm saying a big multinational will come along saying, I'm buying the assets of your company. If I buy the assets of your company, then the money goes first to the company. The company takes its IP, it takes its customers, it takes its computers and its chairs and its people who are, who are working for it, and it sells it over to, to, to the acquirer. The company is left as a shell with the money it receives from, from that acquisition. Then that, uh, company that has the money that's flowed in the company is taxable in the hands of the company that's been bought. So tax will be paid before the exit money flows out to, to the investor. So what I'm, uh, what I'm, what I'm trying to, to impress upon everybody here is we tell everybody your, um, ta your, your investments are, will be ordinarily tax-free, but if the exit is uh, in, in an asset sale, and I'm making make, make myself clear, 
there is a, uh, a tax leakage that can be held at source. Now, this is anywhere in, in the world. It, we, we don't only make investments in Israeli companies. About 70%, as I said, are in Israeli companies. We make a lot of, a lot of investments in American companies. We will make, uh, we've made uh, investments elsewhere. Um, if, if a foreign investor is, made, uh, is invested in an American company, it would also ordinarily be free of tax on, on capital gain uh, when the exit happens on, from that American company. But again, all these things have to be aggregated. It's fine if, the, if the, uh, the exit is a sale of securities, a sale of shares in the company. If it's assets, there's another, there, there's another, another implication. Now, one other thing I wanted to cover is, uh, I said, we are trying to make the environment as friendly for our investors as possible. You may have heard um, that our crowd have uh, come to an agreement with the Israeli tax authorities to be able to apply the angel's law to the investments that are made in, in uh, our, uh, the our crowd company. Now, what is the, the angel's law? The angel's law tells you in the year that you make an investment, you can, re you can write off that investment against your, your taxable income. Now, up to, up to now, when the, when the law was instituted, it did not allow anybody investing in a VC fund to benefit from that, from that law. We have managed to get its, uh, a, a dispensation from the Israeli tax, tax authority that it will, will play, apply to, to our crowd under certain circumstances. The company itself must receive accreditation from the uh, Israel Investment Authority to say that it's an accredited company to benefit from this law. It's not uh, entirely in our hands, but we have made the effort to be able to uh, apply that law law to, to anybody uh, who's investing in Israel. Similarly, in, a, in the UK, there's a, 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 um, uh, a, a tax system called EIS, um, where, again, people are allowed to get tax write-offs on the, uh, in the year that they make the investment, which is very attractive. <clears throat> um, and we are working with uh, lawyers and accountants and, uh, within the UK to be able to get some of our companies accredited in the UK, it's, there are a number of rules and regulations that uh, have to be dealt with, uh, but we are making that available and we're working with partners in the UK uh, to be able to set up that, that, uh, that ability. So I'm, I'm sure we're not, I haven't got hundreds of people from the UK who are investing sitting in the room here at the moment, but what I'm, what I'm trying to explain to you is that our crowd is on the case. We're here to try and make that, uh, that playing field as level as possible and to be able to make things as transparent as possible. But uh, coming back to, to what uh, Noah said, everybody who's uh, investing in our crowd should, whenever they make an investment, consult with their, 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 their local tax consultants to make sure that they're not making any, any mistakes and we will assist anybody uh, who, who requires information or, or, or requires uh, uh, help when they're, when they're uh, submitting their taxes in their local jurisdiction. Um. Thank you, Ravi. So now we'll shift over to Q&A again. Anu, Ravi, and myself are available. Um, another point to your question is, um, Depending on how you set up the investment, you could be using an entity, you could be using a trust or whatever, so its residency defines no problem. Okay, so we have a question over here. Okay. Yes. Or funds, you could use it however you like. Correct. We've decided to set each fund up as a unique opportunity, and the specific deal terms are visible from the beginning. But the way it works is that as the funds experience exits, there are distributions throughout the life of the funds. Correct. And only at the point, and also with individual investments, only at the point in which all committed capital has been returned, There's a, at that point in time, is there a consideration of carry, both on individual investments and also based on fund investments. Is that clear? Good. These are, not These are not evergreen funds, that is correct. For people who don't understand what an evergreen fund is, that you can keep on putting money in and out and in and out. Mostly those are uh, public equity funds. So we have a question over here. Shares through our crowd in that company were still worth something. What happens to 
Good question. I don't know what dumping a company means. So we don't. A company would. So in the event, Robbie's going to jump into that one. Okay. Very, very fair point. And anybody who's investing in our, in our uh, uh, sector has to realize that the majority of their companies are not going to be home runs. Okay? So you get to a situation where a company is not doing well. In the extreme situation, the company will be closed down. The, the assets will be worthless, and we will issue a, a, on the K-1 or whatever a statement you require that the company has been, been closed, and it's a write-off. And you, you go to your, your, your accountant, and you will write off that investment uh, in your tax return. What we will try and do if a company is struggling is try and find somebody to buy that, that company or buy the assets of that company, which have, has happened a couple of times already, uh, and we've either been able to recoup the full amount of the investment, or 80% of the investment, or sometimes 120%. If that happens, then the money gets just distributed back out to the investors, like 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 in any other situation. So, um, uh, and and uh, what we're asking, you know, what 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 may happen is that a company chugs along for many many years, which does does happen, not very often. And in a situation like that, uh, after eight or ten years, we will come to a decision either to distribute the stock in the, in the company to the to, to the our crowd investors, or to try and find a secondary buyer for that for the stock in the company and distribute the, the cash to you, or we would transfer the the the, the shares. Uh, to a, a liquidating trust that will be held on behalf of, uh, of the, the investors until an eventual exit happens. But that's an, an edge case situation. Yeah. Cash. Yeah, but are you with the Oh, uh, Everybody... Uh, uh, when you, when you invest in, a, in an outcrowd company, so you, uh, there's a particular round of investments in that, in that company, and we, but let's say we buy 1,000 shares, and you, you, uh, you own, let's say, 5% of that, so you are entitled to, to f the, the return on 5% of those 1,000 shares, on 50 of those shares. And therefore, when the, when the exit comes and we get whatever money any happens, it's distributed on the basis of, uh, of the shares that you were entitled to when you made the investment. Now, the only thing, that the, the, the rider I put on that is that quite often we do follow-on rounds. Okay, so let's say a company's uh, starting out and we'll do an A round and we'll raise a million dollars for them and then two years later they'll do a, a B round and we'll re or raise three million dollars for them. You can make a decision at the, at the B round whether you want to invest again, whether you want to invest the same pro rata that you had first time, more or less or not at all. So what we do is we will open up a, a separate class of the investment and your, your rights will be based on the, uh, on the, uh, the investment that you made. So you, you will get the, the percentage, the relative percentage at each round of the investment. Before I get another question, I'm going to jump to a prepared slide. Fees. The way our crowd works is that we do management fees on the front, similar to a VC fund but different, and carried interest on the back, also similar to a VC fund. On individual investments, and this is available on the website, on individual investments, our crowd charges 2% management fees for four years capped on invested capital. And 4% for administrative fees associated with the investments. And I'll give real world examples so you can understand how the numbers work. Okay. Another person asked about the minimums. It's a nice segue to bring those two together. Our crowd set a $10,000 US minimum for any particular company. Let's say I invest $10,000 or I commit $10,000 to invest in company X. $714 or 2% of invested capital is held in escrow for four years. In addition, $354 is held in escrow for the administrative costs associated with reporting with filing, with all things associated, again, with administrative costs. Instead of a VC fund having it kind of being hidden away in line items, we've decided to cap it. If an investment lasts longer than four years, we do not take additional capital for that investment. So effectively, $8,929 net goes into a particular company. Let's say 
that company experiences an exit, and again, for the sake of um, ease, $100,000 comes back. Okay, the first $10,000 is what you invested. The remaining $40,000, which would make it a 5x, it's your first x and then four more, our crowd takes 20% carry on that, which would be the equivalent of, who knows math, um, was it $10,000? $8,000, okay? So you would get $48,000, our crowd would get $42,000, our crowd gets $48,000. Now, the second $50,000, because we said it was a $100,000 exit, every dollar over, or the delta over a 5X, our crowd takes 25% carry. So our crowd would take $10,000 of, right? No, $12,500 of the $50,000. So our crowd's total uh, profit on that one would be the 20,050, right? 20,500. And uh, the investor would get 79,500, if that's my math. So what you just said to all three methods of investing? Portfolio reserve is a construct to facilitate smooth investments. In and of itself, it is not an investment. It enables people to make one transfer, and then you can do multiple investments. Or you could decide, I want it all to go into any particular company, investors in portfolio reserve, maintain full discretion over the use of capital in that account. It's just a construct to facilitate easier investment. Funds have a different structure, and on an individual fund basis, you would look and see what that is. And the funds are different, but what is true, well, funds are different. We'll leave it at that because it's the most simplistic way. And anyone who has any questions, I've given you my cards. And for those people who I haven't given my cards, I apologize, but I have a lot more over here. Please come up and find me. I will speak with many of you afterwards, but also we have a whole team of international investor relations people that depending on the geographies in which you're in and the times, we will have different people uh, maintain the relations with, with you so you can ask all the questions that you have. Again, none of us are investment advisors, but we will try to give you all the information that you need to make informed decisions. We have a question over here. Good questions. Um, no one is investing in our crowd, the parent company. Well, there might be some people eventually, but you are investing in individual companies alongside our crowd. In general, our crowd secures things like anti-dilution protections, liquidation preference, and things like that, which we can mitigate some elements of risk and to add additional protections when things go wrong. That's how we negotiate deals. You can see that on any particular deal term. Sometimes there are particularly attractive liquidation preferences like a 3X. Anyone who doesn't know what a liquidation preference, email me afterwards. But it's a fundamental uh, tenant of investment structures which are incredibly important for understanding how to be successful. But in general, there's no guarantee. We're all in the same boat together. Our crowd puts between 5 and 10% of our own capital into any particular company. 
we are not investment advisors, but we do tell you that there are strategies that the best investors utilize like diversification, investing in what you know, being proactive in your investments, um, and other types of strategies. But this is at the absolute corner. And again, this is not investment advice either, but we are on the corner of risk in terms of where things are. So everyone can take the perspective that as soon as the money's invested, I'm okay with it not being returned, but I'm hoping that it will because I think this is a great opportunity. It's been significantly diligence. We're all trying to work to make these companies be successful, but this is venture, let's not mince words. This is, you know, you could lose the whole pot. This is exactly what this asset class is like. We have a question over here again. Okay, so you asked the question before I could write down the notes, but I know the answer. Basically, our crowd has an observer or a board director in about 70% of our investments. And you know up front, again, in the deal terms, whether our crowd has secured such governance. Our crowd has had to take, actually, let me take a step back before I go into that. Our crowd, through its corporate diligence, which before we finalize an investment in a particular company, we go through contracts, we go through all kinds of different legal diligence where we have have identified um, uh, peculiarities which require additional investigation, which have actually stopped investments in companies. We were one of our earlier companies uh, we raised uh, $1.3 million for, and we had to tell investors, I'm sorry, we are not going ahead with the investment. We had to give it back to the investors because it never actually went to the company. As Robbie was alluding to, we set up special purpose vehicles which we collect the money in the escrow for and then transfer the money from the escrow to the BVI then into the company. But until we've completed our corporate diligence of signed off that it ticked all the boxes that we could possibly look in a reasonable manner, which include financial, legal, and other types of diligence, they do not get the funds. So in addition to doing significant screening before the point of investment, we have the corporate diligence afterwards. We have had situations, and this is where I was jumping back to, where we've had to take very proactive actions in terms of uh, senior members of portfolio companies. Our crowd has placed numerous uh, executives on companies, people who we've actually curated from the crowd who have particular sector knowledge and expertise who then go and actually serve both the company and our crowd and the investor's interests. Uh, one recent placement that our crowd performed was Biocatch, a currently performing company, where one of our investors who's particularly knowledgeable in the space has stepped up to become the CEO. Um, there are other examples of this where our crowd is not a passive uh, investor. We are trying to the best of our ability to protect and accelerate our investments. Do we have other questions? Don't be shy. Okay, any more questions, last bits? So again, myself, Robbie, and other people are around. Please ask questions, please stay involved. Please let us know what you think we're doing well, but also what we're not doing well, because if everyone just says, yeah, yeah, you're doing awesome, we're not gonna improve our products. And that's really what we're trying to do. So be incredibly critical. Do not be polite like a Westerner, but be very chutzpahdik like an Israeli. Thank you so much, Anu. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and I'll speak with you soon.